Hi everyone, my name is Kiana Davis and I am your presenter today. I'm going to talk to you today about my project called Unyielding Roots and I'm going to tell some hair stories. All right, so once again, my name is Kiana Davis. I'm an author. Here are two of my books, Digging for Roots and From These Roots Up. I'm a narrative poet, storyteller, so they're both about my experience growing up. Um, the first book, Digging for Roots, is about my experience growing up in Richmond, California, and not really learning about my culture, not really learning about Black culture, or Black history, and the impact it had on me. It all started with a Black doll and how this particular doll was nowhere to be found. My second book, From These Roots Up, is about um, cultural um, problems I saw in my community and institutional practices of racism and how it impacted myself, my community, um, and my family. Once again, I'm also a teacher. I work with, at Renton Technical College and I help adults and young people earn their high school diploma and their GEDs. Let's get started. So how my project came about. Um, last year, I was given a grant from Floor Culture. I applied for a couple of reasons. One, in 2008, I went natural. And what that means is that I stopped chemically processing my hair and allowed my hair to grow in its natural state. And what I learned about my hair was that it was very unyielding and it did not compromise who it was. It didn't care about assimilating or being flexible. It wanted to just grow out of my head the way it grew out of my head. And so it taught me, it's teaching me still a lot about myself and being who I am and being proud of my culture and my heritage. I applied for the grant. Um, secondly, because in 2013, up until today, I have been seeing story after story of young girls and young boys as well uh, of hair hair trauma. Their, inter their education has been interrupted because of their natural hair or their natural hairstyles. So the first story I noticed was um, a 12 year old girl in 2013, a violinist, Vanessa Van Dyke, and she faced expulsion because she came to school with her afro, her hair in an afro, and the school couldn't handle it. The second young girl I saw around that time was Tiana Parker, who was just seven at the time. She had worn her hair in dreadlocks the year before. But after summer, the school put together some policies and when she returned, they said that she could not attend the school if she had her hair in dreads. And I remember watching the coverage of both young girls and they both looked very deflated. And Tiana, who was seven, cried visibly on the news. And it was heartbreaking. And I wish that was it, but there's just been story after story of young girls and women and boys that have had the interruption to their education or employment because of their hair. And so my project is called Unmuting Roots. It's a poetry project, hair story project. I'm looking for stories um, that convey what the impact of um, the media, uh, institutional practices, and just the view of how our hair is seen and how it's reflected in how we look at ourselves. In my workshop, I'm going to talk about different hair stories. I'm going to go, I found some really interesting stories about hair in different cultures. So I'm going to explore some of those stories. And then I'm going to end it with African-American hair discrimination. All right, let's get started. Now, here's a picture of my hair. Pretty artistic looking, but this is one of my hair story poems. It's called DNA. Beautiful, kinky, coily texture. Curly, full, thick, fluffy, natural. My hair is not a fad. It's a part of me. My lineage, my DNA. All right, so some objectives I have. After this workshop, I'm hoping that you will understand what hair symbolizes in different cultures around the world. Also, I'm hoping that you've written some poetry um, or reflective writing on hair, hair discrimination, or just your own personal um, hair stories. I did put hair discrimination in there, but it could be about anything really. Um, and then you're gonna see this little sign that says, it's the right time. 
I am pretty silly, so you might see my humor reflected throughout the workshop. Um, but when you see that symbol, I'm going to ask you to do some things. One, I'm going to ask you to reflect on the question, and then I'm going to ask you to think about your story or someone else's story, um, all dealing with hair and identity. Um, and I I'm going to um, hope after this workshop you'll learn the history of black hair discrimination black women have faced in America. The history of hair discrimination black women have faced. So that's something, those are some things I'm hoping you're going to get out of the workshop. Um, and also triggers. So my job is not to trigger anyone, make anyone feel bad about the information I'm presenting. You know, these things happened centuries ago. These policies were in place before we were born. But they're still happening. So I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad if it's happening to you. You might feel bad. You might feel triggered if you have never heard of this before. And maybe the um, dominant group is doing or the privileged group is doing that looks like you. I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad. What I would love for you to do is have an open heart. I would like you to have an open mind. Now, I'm not an expert in this matter. I'm a narrative poet. I'm a teacher. And there are a lot of hair stories out there, cultural. I have just picked a few. But there's a plethora of books out there. There's a plethora of articles. Pl please feel free to keep this conversation going. Don't stop with me, OK? So have an open mind. Please be open to writing. And sharing is always caring is one of my favorite models. So what is poetry? Or why am I asking you to write poetry? So poetry is just the genre of writing that I love. And I'm a poet, and I write poetry books. Um, but really, you can write just reflective pieces. You can write whatever comes to mind. It doesn't have to be a poem. Um, but Lucille Clifton said it best, I think. Poetry is a matter of life, not just a matter of language. I started writing poetry early on. It saved my life, I would say. Um, because it allowed me to write about what was going on around me. And I was able to see a lot of different perspectives after I wrote. So poetry is important for me. Now, I'm not going to just ask you to write poetry without a little bit of education on poetry. So let's get started there. Now, poetic devices. Cool things you can do to bring your poetry to life. One of my favorite poetic devices is personification. Now, normally in my workshop, I ask all the participants to say personification on three. So I count off like one, two, three, and everyone has to say personification. But I won't do that today. But personification is a writer using um, personification to give human characteristics or human qualities to something that doesn't live, that's non-human. That's one of my favorite poetic devices. Um, it's an effective way to add interest to your writing and can truly bring your writing, bring your description to life. So T.S. Eliot, amazing writer, wrote, April is the cruelest month. Awesome. April has now emotions. And so that's how he brought it to life. So I really like that example. And as y'all can guess, I love personifications. A next poetic device are pretty popular. And they can be used in poetry, out of poetry, but similes, we use them all the time. Um, a simile compares two things um, using the words like or as. The late afternoon sky bloomed in the window for a moment like the blue honey of the Mediterranean. F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby. I love that. So I'm going to read it one more time. The late afternoon sky bloom in the window for a moment like the blue honey of the Mediterranean. Very great imagery. Okay, we've got the simile. Next we have metaphors. Metaphors are also really popular. Poetry, in and out of poetry, you can write them. People use them all the time. Metaphors are direct comparisons between two things that Unlike similes, do not use the words like or as. So examples, fill your paper with the breathings of your heart. Williams Wordsworth. And then we have one more from Big Boy from Outcast. I'm cooler than a polar bear's toenails. All right, two cool examples of metaphors. 
Now, if you're thinking I've never written poetry before, how can I write poetry in such a short amount of time? No problem. One of the poetry, poetic styles I also like will be a list poem. List poems are just that. They can be a list of inventory of items, people, places, ideas. List poems are often involve repetition. List poems can also rhyme, but they don't have to rhyme. Now here's an example of a list poem that I wrote from this picture. Brown girl, long, wavy, thick hair, dreaming eyes, standing against stone. I wonder if she is happy. I wonder if her smile is real. I wonder if she is free to love who she is. So list poems are really great ways to just get your information, your ideas out without having the fear um, of writing a poem. Another really um, great poetic style that I like is free verse poems. Free verse poems rhyme. They don't have to rhyme. They don't have to have rhyme scheme. They don't have to follow the regular rules of poetry or rhyme. So some poets really like to rhyme. I'm not a rhyming poet, but if you are, rhyme away. Uh, but free verse allows you not to have to worry about what are the rules with writing. Just but a great way to self-express. All right. So you might be thinking, how am I supposed to write a poem? I have no idea what I'm doing or I haven't written a poem or I'm not sure exactly what's going through your head. But I know sometimes when I teach this workshop, I like to talk about detail builders. If I give you a topic, you might feel like, what? You might get stuck. And so these are great tools to use. Who, what, when, where, how, and why. There are great ways to just help you unpack a thought and break down a concept. So detail builders. All right, look at that. There's a sign. It's the right time. It's showing up already. I'm going to show this video, but right before I do, I want you to just pay attention to the young girls or the um, poet's hair confidence. And I want you to think about hair esteem and confidence and where it comes from for you. Where did you learn how to love your hair or embrace your hair? Don't need a trip to the beauty shop Cause I love what I got on the top It's curly and it's brown And it's right up there You know what I love That's right My hair! I really love my hair We see her hair esteem. So I want you to take a time, take the time to think about where your hair esteem comes from, hair confidence. It could come from your mom, it could come from your family, it could come from any various places. So normally I give writers or participants two minutes to think through um, this question. And so 
after, I always like um, participants to also share with a partner, maybe someone they haven't talked to before, don't know, and go over and maybe um, turn to them and share what they've written. But that's probably scaring people right there. Let's just go ahead and write. <laughs> and then think about um, the question, reflect on it. I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds, but this would be a great place to pause the video if you need more time. All right, so hair in every culture has symbolism. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna talk about some different hair stories. So I went through um, and just looked up some stories about hair and what hair symbolized for different cultures. And here's some stories I found. Many ancient cultures believe there is power in uncut hair. Uh, long hair in Native American culture Long hair has symbolic significance tying them to Mother Earth. Mother Earth is known as sweet grasses. Many Native Americans believe their hair is physical, the physical, a physical manifestation of growth of spirit, and some say it allows extra sensory perception, connections to all things. Native Americans um, did not trim or cut their hair except during times of mourning, which is symbolic for the loss of a loved one. So I found this information um, and the link, the website um, is in the last slide of the presentation, but I'm not sure if this is for all Native American tribes, but this was really an amazing hair story, I thought, that how they saw hair as a symbolic uh, representation of Mother Earth and even named it as sweet grasses. That's amazing. And then to cut their hair, you know, if you saw a Native American with their hair cut, it symbolizes a loss of a loved one. Amazing. So this is a um, um, Native American hair story. Another hair story that I found was South American hair braiding, Peru. Throughout Peru, you will see Native women of all ages wearing long braids. Long braided hair represents much more than just a hairstyle. The braids signify the marital status of the Peruvian women. Two braids reveal that a woman uh, in the tribe is married while one or many braids means that she is single. So just think about that. This is a really great story. So if you saw a woman with two braids, that lets you know she's married. Well, many cultures have rings for that, right? And this is our hair. And if the many braids are one braid, she is single. So I thought this was an amazing hair story as well. So religious head covering. It says guide on there, but disregard that. But here are just some um, different um, things I found about women who cover their hair. Um, Muslim women cover their heads in a, a part of their face, accordance with Islamic principles of hair dressing modestly. Um, some of the garments cover their hair, ears, throat, although the face is exposed. So I did present this, uh, and a woman in um, a Muslim woman told me that it also covers their glory, like their beauty, but they don't want everyone to see their beauty which is similar to the Orthodox women, uh, I thought, because the Orthodox women, um, once married, um, should not show her hair, only to her husband in private. It's considered sacred bond between a husband and wife. For many, it's an important way that a married woman says to the world that she is not available. Uh, many women, ultra-Orthodox um, communities shave their heads as well. Okay, so this is where the hair is so precious um, that they don't even show only their loved ones or their husband what their hair looks like. So this, I thought, was an amazing hair story. All right, so there is a village in China that has um, the uh, world's longest hair villages in China. So that I thought this was awesome. Um, the secret of keeping one hair long and shiny uh, and away from gray hair is to wash hair with water used um, to clean rice. So I know in the natural hair movement, the recent, like last year, I heard a lot of the uh, women of color were talking about washing their hair with rice water. And this is where it originated from. So this is what we learned. Um, they do not cut their hair from birth. When we reach the age of 18, we get our first haircut as a part of coming of age ceremony, which signifies the girl is now an adult and can marry. The hair cut off at the ceremony is not allowed to be thrown away, but preserved. After marriage and childbirth, 
this section of their hair is weaved and worn in the form of a hairpin, so to speak, as a distinction between married and unmarried women. Um, so this is an article I found, and the link is in the last slide of my presentation. But this is really, I thought, an amazing hair story because one, they don't cut their hair until they're 18. And then they take the hair and turn it into a hairpin. Amazing. So here's a picture of the women in this village. And look how long their hair is. No gray hair in sight. And they take a lot of time with their hair. So the hair is very significant. All right. It's the right time. So think about your hair and how you wear it or how you've worn it, or maybe how you've wanted to wear your hair, but you couldn't. Um, what does your hair say about you? You know, what does it represent? What does it have, does it say something about your community or where you come from? Are you just able to wear your hair just the way you want it? So it's the right time. I'm gonna be quiet for a few seconds, but this will be a great time to pause the video if you're listening to this in the group, find a new partner to share with if you'd like to after. Um, I don't ask people, I don't force people to share, but sharing is sometimes caring. So think about that. So here's the question again. What does your hair say about you? All right. Another really interesting hair story I found were the Polynesians. Um, the spiritual aspect of their custom is fascinating with a strong belief in mana, which is a strong spiritual force, energy, form of energy, which we all possess. Polynesians believe that our hair contains mana, which links to our bodies. Um, so it is culturally very rare to have reason to cut their hair. In ancient tradition, it is believed that even the disposal of hair must be considered a considered matter. For even a passing bird that managed to catch a strand of their hair and uses it to build a nest can have consequences, a headache for that person. So this was definitely something I heard about when I was growing up. My mother would do my hair, comb my hair, and then she would burn the hair because she said, if a bird finds your hair, you're going to get a headache, they're going to put it in their nest. So I thought this was really interesting. It's kind of like a superstition of sorts. So the Polynesian hair story. All right, here's another hair story. Hindu women. Uh, now, I learned about this story, um, their hair um, symbolism and practice uh, from a documentary called Good Hair by Chris Watt, where he went to the temple and he saw the sacrifice that many women were making um, to their gods. So. Hindu women grow their hair long to please their gods. Every year, millions of people travel to two temples in southern India, hoping for an answer to their prayers. But every miracle requires a sacrifice, and many pilgrims sacrifice their hair. So in the documentary, once again, called Good Hair, you see women going there, even babies, having their hair cut off. And they sacrifice their hair, they have a ceremony, what I don't think the women know or what's not known to the um, custom is that that hair is then taken and processed and turned into wigs and weaves. So the hair is still used throughout the world. So their hair in southern India could end up in New York. So um, hair stories. Hindu women. Uh-oh, we got another one. Yay! It's the right time. So let's think about your culture and what your hair symbolizes. Is there a practice that you share in your culture um, around hair? Maybe not cutting it, or maybe dyeing it, or maybe there's no culture. But think about it. In my culture, hair symbolizes. So I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds. This would be a great time to write. Think about your hair and what it symbolizes in your culture. All right, thank you. Now we're going to get into African culture and hair. Um, the history of hair in Africa. Hair played a significant role in culture of ancient African civilization as it symbolized as one of a family's background, social status, spirituality, tribe, community, and marital status. 
hair is also a social activity as it is today. So we still do that. So they want to go to hair salons and we sit around and gather and talk about life. Right. So that was the same thing that happened in Africa around here. So look at these amazing elaborate hairstyles. So as we look at these African hairstyles, I want you to take note to how long the hairstyles have been um, originated, like how long they've been in play, I guess we can say. And then I'm going to talk to you about how a lot of times actually women of color are still wearing many of these hairstyles that originated in Africa maybe 300 years ago. And these are some of the same styles that young girls and women are either being having their education interrupted because they don't fit the norm, or maybe being fired or reprimanded at their job because they're wearing these hairstyles. All right, so the first one we have is um, Amazon, Amazonza. It was traditionally worn by Ro Rwanda men and unmarried women until only about 100 years ago. The style indicated social status and signaled the age for marriage. So I'm not sure if you recognize the act actress on the right, but this is Lupita. She's a famous actress, and I believe she was in the Black Panther. All right, our second hair story goes to the Bantu knots. Um, here's another famous face, Rihanna. Bantu means people and is a blanket term used to describe the 300 to 600 year, I mean, 300 uh, ethnic groups within Southern Africa. Bantu knots are also known as Zulu knots because the Zulu people um, a Bantu ethnic group were the first to wear the styles. So this hairstyle is actually still um, happening. I know a lot of natural hair um, women on YouTube, I've seen them wear these hairstyles. I haven't worn my hair like this, but my sister has and my best friend has. So this is amazing that this hairstyle is still around. All right, here's another famous face, um, Erica Badu. She's a famous singer. And she's wearing threaded hair, uh, faux locks. Hair threading has always been an integral part of African beauty, especially in West Africa. It is both a fashionable and protective and has been worn for ages. So this locks date back as far as to, um, 2500 BC. So that's how long they've been um, worn. That is pretty long and they're beautiful. A lot of women today uh, are wearing faux locks. Um, and these are also this is another style that young girls and um, young boys are being uh, reprimanded for. There was a young man, I believe, last year who was playing, um, he was a wrestler, and he could not continue wrestling until his hair was cut. So the, I think a referee or a coach had to cut his hair in order for him to play because of his dreadlocks. All right, another famous face you might recognize, Kim Kardashian. Now, she's wearing Fulani braids. Fulanis are primarily Muslim, traditionally pastoral ethnic group in Africa that's scattered throughout West Africa and parts of East Africa. Fulani bride hair is especially colorful and deliberately adorned. Now, these braids can be traced 30,000 years back. That's amazing. And so young girls still today, black, young black girls and women are wearing these hairstyles. And look how old they are. Um, and then we have Kim Kardashian, who's a famous celebrity who's wearing them. So, amazing. All right, we've got another question. So I want you to think about your hair and the connection your hair may have. Does it have connections to your community? Does it have a connection to how you feel about yourself, your self-esteem? What is your hair connected to? Or maybe your hair doesn't necessarily have a connection, but maybe your grandmother's hair. Or maybe there's a hair story um, that you'd like to share. So this is where I take a few minutes, two minutes, and pause the workshop. So I'm going to just be quiet for a few minutes, but of course, pause. My hair connects me to. All right, thank you. So now we're going to look at America and slavery and black hair. So this law I thought was pretty interesting for a hair story to share. Uh, the Tegan law was banning the black hair in general. So black women in Louisiana um, were African and Creole. So there were some mixed women there. And what they were doing was they were wearing their hair with like flowers and um, 
shells and just different things, maybe leaves. And their hair was so elaborate, they were seen as very attractive women. And the law had to come in place in about 18, no, 1786 in Louisiana um, because they wanted to stop women from looking so attractive because it was threatening to the white women. And a lot of the men were very attractive to the, um, the slaves. I guess you would say the women that were slaves there. And so what they said is they could not show their hair. So they had to cover their heads to stop the attraction that was happening. Um, however, black women did not despair. Instead, they abided by the rule and turned it into fashion. The women used unique colors, jewels, ribbons, and wrapping styles, which accentuated their gorgeousness even more. Out of this bore various hair ties seen today on women of color using unique materials, patterns, and flair. The law ended in the 1800s, but Black women continued um, rocking their head wraps. So this was a, um, a law that was going to stop Black women from showing their hair at all, and they took the law. Let will go back to the picture. Look how beautifully adorned this hair wrap is. So she, her hair is covered, and then she put this stylish hat on there, which is beautiful. All right, there's a Tegan Law hair story. Now, here's another interesting hair story, Maps of maps to Freedom. So this hairstyle is called cornrows. All right, so during Atlantic slave trade, many slaves were forced to shave their heads to be more sanitary and also to move um, around from cultures and identity, and also move them away from their culture and identity. I also learned that a lot of times the slave, um, the mistress of the house, the woman of the house would shave a woman's hair if she thought she was too attractive. Um, but not all enslaved Africans um, would not keep their hair cut. Many would braid their hairs tightly in cornrows to maintain a neat and tidy appearance. Enslaved Africans also used cornrows to transfer and create maps to leave plantations and home of their um, captors. This act of hair as a tool for resistance is said to have been evident across South America as well. So look how tightly they've woven their hair together and they've used these hairstyles for maps for freedom. Amazing hair story. Uh, let's see, um, history of cornrows. Depictions of women with cornrows have been found in Stone Age paintings in the Sahara and have been dated back 3000 um, BC. There are also Native American paintings as far back as 1,000 years showing cornrows as a hairstyle. This tradition of female styling and cornrows has re remained popular throughout Africa, and particularly in horns of Africa and West Africa. Now, the cornrows are also worn in America, and this is another style that if you were um, to certain schools or work, that would be deemed unprofessional, and you could possibly maybe um, be reprimanded at your job, or you could be expelled at your school. All right, so now we have the black hair movement. Um, Tracy Ellis Ross says, I love my hair because it's a reflection of my soul. It's dense, it's kinky, it's soft, it's textured, it's difficult, it's easy and fun. That's why I love my hair. Society says beauty is, but my definition of beauty so when I was putting together this workshop, I said, let me put in magazines. Let me see what's beautiful. What's the standard for beauty? So in this particular magazine, this, this picture, you do see some different women of different colors, right? You do see different hair textures and, right? But predominantly, it's a European, Eurocentric, right? Is a form of beauty. But I want you to say, I want you to think about what society says beauty is. But what's your own personal definition? And so it's the right time to write. So I'm going to give a pause and you can take one minute or two minutes as long as you need as a group and think about what um, your definition of beauty is. Now, for these particular questions, um, wherever these questions take you, that's where I want you to write about. Maybe you'll write about society says beauty is and write a list poem on that or just a reflective piece on that. Or maybe you'll say my definition of beauty is. And it's really only up to you what you decide to write. And it's the right time. So I'm going to be quiet and give you a chance to write.
All right, thank you. So, 60s and 70s was known, were known, was known as the Black Hair Movement. I'm not sure if you recognize this woman in the picture. It's Angela Davis. She's a very famous American political activist, academic, and um, author. Um, this piece was, I've got this information from Ebony Magazine. Uh, it just breaks down the movement at the time. The Afro was a Black beauty personified without white um, validation, and it did not care about critics. So this is a time where black people, um, women and men, were just wearing their own hair and they turned it into an Afro. Um, in the 60s, after decades of subjecting ourselves to European beauty standards, we decided to take back our hair. The newfound self-acceptance was widely known as the Black is Beautiful movement, which sprang from the Black Power movement. So there's a famous song by um, James Brown, I'm Black and I'm Proud. And that meant, um, in that particular time frame, was to embrace their hair and the texture and how it grew. Now, in the so this is 60s and 70s. There is another movement in the 80s and 90s. I didn't really cover because I wanted to go here, and then I'm going to talk about the natural hair movement. So, um, the natural hair movement is a movement which encourages women and men of African descent to keep their natural Afro texture hair. It originated in the United States during the 60s, with the most recent iteration during the 2000s. So 2000, uh, that era is when, like 2008, when I decided to go natural. And that's also when Chris Rock put out his um, documentary called Good Hair. Where he talked about what is good hair. He also talked about how um, black women were chemically processing their hair. And he broke down some concepts and things that I think stopped a lot of us from using uh, relaxers or perms, which had a lot of um, chemicals that could um, cause fibroids and cancer. And so this is where the hair movements, the natural hair movement started. And with the natural hair movement, I began to notice this trend happening. And so this picture was NPR, I think about two years ago. And this image, I think, just summarizes the whole issue and why I decided to do the Unmuting Roots Project. So the title, the caption for the article is, when black hair violates the dress code. So we just learned about hair stories from different cultures. We've talked about African hair culture, hair stories. And so you have these two young girls of color that are getting ready to go to class. And you have this instructor right here. I don't know what, if you know body language, that doesn't look welcoming right so we have these braids maybe these are Fulani braids which are said to have been 3,000 years old 30,000 years old right you have afro textured hair here I like the little stars around the girls oh right but you see that this is not welcoming and it's all because of their hair and so when black hair violates the dress code and that is one of the issues I want to talk to young girls about is how, how does that impact them? How does that make them feel about their hair? Um, this is a poem I wrote um, for a young girl. I believe this happened in her early 2020, just like a few months ago when school started. Her name is Audrey. Aubrey, Audrey, she's in, uh, she lives just in Puyallup here. She's in fifth grade. And what she decided to do was wear her hair just like this. She decided to go to school with her hair out, naturally out, which could resemble an afro or just a big, you know, uh, big puff of hair, what some people call it. And when she got to school, her classmates, as well as other students, were telling her that they didn't like her hair. They even went as far to say her hair was ugly and that she looked ugly with that hair. And she went home distraught and she told her mother her mother said well what happened what's going on and she told her what everyone said so the mother not only went to the school and complained but she also went to the news and that's how I heard about it so this poem is for Audrey and all the Audrey's that are out there this is my hair these are my roots thick coily and unwavering my hair grows unyielding under the weight of policies and labels of not being enough, but it will not bend or change who it is. It will fight to remain everything it is told not to be, unapologetically free. 
All right, so these are some stories that I found online um, when I was doing my research and just some of the stories that, I, that were really just unnerving to me because this is how our hair grows out of our head. So look at the hair texture. And so the schools have put policies in place that stop young girls from wearing their own hair. And some questions I have is why. I'm working on my master's right now in education. I found nothing that says that when a young person comes to school with their hair in its natural state, they can't learn. Um, so this young girl here is from South Africa. Um, so just think about it. she's from South Africa, but she attended a private school and all the girls were restricted to for wearing natural hair. They were only allowed, they were told to press their hair out of where their hair straight. Um, here we have Vanessa Van Dyke, who I was talking about in the beginning of the video. And here is um, her afro, and here's her mom. And she's being bullied for her puffy hair by classmates at her faith Christian academy. And she risked expulsion at her school if she continued to wear her hair that way. Now this young girl is 12 years old. She also plays the violin, but that's not enough because this is how she wants to wear her hair. And somehow that's a problem. Um, this video, this picture here is uh, a young girl who says my principal wanted to embarrass me like my natural hair was ugly. So that's the messaging that happens when school officials say you can't wear your hair in a certain style and even deem a hairstyle as a fad. When we just learned that a lot of these hairstyles are hundreds of years old. Um, so that's disheartening. Here are a couple more, several more stories. So this is a young girl here, um, a third grader from Texas who wore her hair in a full hawk and she was pulled out of class. Um, the young girl who's crying here in the right corner uh, was sent home from school because of her extensions. Um, I put, uh, I was in an interview at Bellevue College a few months ago, and one of the things I talked about in my interview is that a lot of times these hairstyles braids can be expensive. Uh, I'm not sure how much she paid for her hair, but a lot of times it could be maybe $100, $150, maybe even just $50. But it is a way for us to braid our hair and to protect it. It's a protective style, that's what we call it. And we use, we braid our hair to protect our hair from just damaging the heat and over combing or processing it as a way to give our hair a break and also be very stylish as well. So as you can see from her crying that she felt pretty devastated when her school said um, she couldn't wear her hair like that. So it becomes this uh, question of either you want to come to school here or you have, you have to choose. You have to choose your hair or you have to choose your education. And is that right? Now, one of the little girls that also caught my attention in the early 2000s was little Tiana here at the bottom. She was sent home from school because of her fattish dreadlocks. Uh, Tiana's braids um, the entire school last year, wore her hair the entire school last year and didn't have any problems. So we in the um, work in the presentation I just talked about, where we had Erica Badu, and we had the locks. Those locks were not a fad; they've actually been around for years. Um, and so it's very disheartening to see that um, they, the school called them fetish. Um, one of the questions I want to talk to younger people about, or even adults, how beauty standards affect the self-esteem of girls of color. Um, Beyonce said um, with her album Lemonade, I like my baby hair with baby hair and afros. So she likes her daughter, her baby's hair with baby hair and afros, which when she was allowing her daughter, Beyonce, to wear her hair in a natural state, people were condemning it. They were saying, why don't you brush your daughter's hair? Why don't you do this to her? A lot of it was internalized oppression from um, the black community. Um, just like in an uproar that she allowed her daughter to wear her hair naturally. Um, so there's also a lot of internalization within the Black community about hair and what it symbolizes for each, each of us. We all have a hair story. We all have um, something that we've learned maybe from society about our hair. Um, some things that are happening around hair is the Crown Act, which ensures protection against discrimination in hairstyles by extending sanctuary protection um, to hair texture and protective styles and fair employment and housing and state education codes. So the Hair Act started just a few years ago and um, 
They passed a law in several jurisdictions, including New Jersey, New York, Virginia, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, Cincinnati, Colorado, California, Washington State. Uh, and similar statewide legislations also have been introduced in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. So as you can see, there are laws that now have to be in place to protect um, black women and boys and, uh, and girls and men because of their hair, the natural texture of hair. Um, there was seeing a lot of discrimination. And so this is a really great um, come about, the hair act, the crown act. All right, that is the end of my presentation. So what I love for Get It Right is a letter to a poet I love to hear what you thought about the workshop. If there are any other cultures I should use or talk about. Um, and then uh, any thoughts just about the hair discrimination in itself. Uh, I know a lot of people haven't really learned about hair discrimination, or maybe you don't know um, what's been going on in the community. But this is definitely, i love to hear what you think about the workshop, what you thought about the presentation. Please let me know. I'm going to pause it for a few seconds. This will give you time to pause and to um, reflect and write me a note and let me know what you thought. All right, thank you for writing. Um, let's see. I am Kiana Davis once again, author, poet, and teacher and storyteller. My project is called Unmuting Roots. And so my website is www.unmutingroots.com. I'm looking for hair stories, um, poetry format to add to my book of anthology that I'm putting together. I mentioned earlier that I got a grant from Fort Culture. And one of my goals is to put together a book of poetry, uh, hair stories for um, Black women, girls, and teens. I'm hoping that the project will bring light to the struggles Black women, girls, and teens face because of their hair. I also would love to take the book to different schools and um, employment agencies or companies and talk to them about their policies around here. Um, if you're interested in reading more of my poetry, uh, my site is poeticawakenings.com, and you can check out my site um, and read some of my poetry there. Uh, at the beginning of the workshop, I mentioned, or in the middle, I talked about um, a hair interview I did at Bellevue College, and the interview is um, on their website. And I just go into length about the process of being natural. Um, that is not, that is, the crazy part of it is you just think of hair. When you think of hair, it seems like a simple matter. But as we went through the workshop, we see that hair is symbolic of so many things for so many cultures. It could be a woman's glory, right? Um, it could be just a status symbol for community, not just for women. That's primarily what I'm talking about in my workshop, but also for men uh, and what it really holds. And so for women of color, my, you know, my belief is our hair is pretty different from a lot of different cultures. Our hair is thicker, it's coily, or it's kinky. Um, also termed um, being deemed nappy. And with those things, we don't have, we can't, you can't really hide. You know, if I wanted to um, keep my hair straight, I have to chemically process it. And to chemically process your hair, you have to use chemicals that could cause cancer or fibroids. Um, it's amazing, you know, just the things that you go through just to be part of society. So I go into lens, I'm just talking about even washing our hair because it's pretty thick, right? Every one of us has different hair texture, but it's pretty thick and it is a process. And, um, you know, is it okay for us to wear our natural hair or should we straighten our hair to be like everyone else? And those are some of the ideas that I talk about in my interview. I love for you to listen to it and check it out. Um, please send me your thoughts. My email address is on the slides and I believe on the website. Here are some of the links that I've gotten um, from the articles that I found. So if you know of any other hair stories, I love to add more hair stories to my workshop. Um, I know there's some other stories about Native American males who had their hair cut. Um, so I love to add more stories to my workshop. So if you have any, please send them to me. And I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for um, listening to me today. I want to also thank you for writing. Um, at the end of my workshop, I like to open it up for open mic. 
Um, if you didn't, if you weren't able to pair and share when you listen to the workshop, this would be a great time. I would open it up for everyone to share their poems, share their thoughts, or any other poetry or writing that you have personally about hair or about esteem or identity. Well, thank you again, and my name is Kiana Davis. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs>